Uh huh. Whoa. <laughs> Uh-huh. Oh. Uh-huh. Oh, that's excellent. That's a, that's, that's a great example, great story. What we know is that relationship is at the foundation of all healing and for trauma eventually in his ability to stay regulated. And this is part of what uh, we are hoping to be able to take into the schools is that we know when many teachers are working with students, uh, particularly inexperienced teachers, some experienced ones, is that they can easily get dysregulated, right? I have a class of 30 kids. Right. And nobody stays in their seat in one spot. And it is, ah. And so the teacher becomes dysregulated, and all it does is dysregulates the kids. They can't. And so what we really do is we teach them how to ground and how to model that and to teach simple grounding skills to the kids, uh, even meditation in some schools. There's some schools that are trauma-informed, and that's what they use. They use a model where no one comes in, and it's not, you know, kids are allowed to play, but no one is kind of, being reactive. I'm not just shouting at you, okay, you know, before I know it. I'm not, you know, coming at you with a kind of face that really just triggers you and that kind of thing. I become, become aware of that. So, yeah, all of that, is, all of that is critical and very important. And the relationship is the foundation of all of that. Without a relationship, uh, therapy doesn't happen uh, very well. In fact, what we know happens is that people tend to uh, re-traumatize individuals. So relationship becomes the first step in it. And then there's a structure to providing treatment, but relationship is where the start. And to start that, what we have to do is teach therapists how to self-regulate and teach others. So if you're working with someone who has trauma, the real first step is really that you're regulated. You know, no magic, just that you were tuning forks. So, you know, it's that, it's that you know, group think that if one person is in a the theater and yells fire and panics, everybody else all of a sudden gets, oh, I'm running out. So it's you, in this sense, you have to model that uh, with the person that you're with. And that's what he did. And that's, that's a great story of, of, of basically just modeling, just, okay, yeah, we're, we're going to do this. He didn't panic, you know, with that. And unfortunately, with many parents, right, that's part of the parenting skills that they need is to be able to regulate themselves. And, you know, they're overwhelmed, and what do they do? You've seen it, right? I was asking about this. <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. Like Somebody, yeah. Mental money gone, and mm -hmm. it's stuff like she got in trouble for mm -hmm. stashing all, instead of cleaning her room, she stashed it all in her room. She's not going to go over there. No yelling at me. No, you got to go back and do it. And she just looks at you like she's gone. Uh huh. Like, and then I'm like, what's the issue here? Okay, you go put it in the stand. Like, she's gone. Mm hmm. So, what ways to help bring her back? Yeah. I, I think grounded. The first thing, first thing is relation. First thing is relationship. You know, one of the things that we don't do sometimes that is critical is that we don't have contact or touch. Bonding is important. Touch is healing when it's done in a supportive, nurturing way. And so, when parents are touching or, or hanging on to their children and talking to them different about these issues, right? Because depending on how busy or hard we are, we might start snapping a little bit. Haven't realized it. Okay. I hear, I'm sorry. Let me come back. Everyone's back? Okay. <laughs> Let me see. I have a little activity I'd just like you to try because I just want you to get a sense what it's like to just kind of be in that sympathetic dominant state, that fight or flight state a little bit if you're okay doing this. It takes one minute. Quick and easy activity. So I'm going to have you, if you'll be kind enough to... You all know each other. I want you to find a partner. Because you know each other, you're not going to get the full effect. But find someone you don't know as well. 
So I need two people to partner off. Just sit. You're going to sit and face each other. So just need. Can I? It can be however you want to do it. I need right here. Okay. Um, however, I just just two. If there's enough, anybody not? Okay. And, okay. So Amy's going to watch. If I could, I'm having them do just a simple uh, exercise where they are going to be sitting facing each other. This is just a way to experience what sympathetic dominance is like when you're triggered. Uh, when someone's in trauma and they're feeling the kind of feelings they're feeling sometimes. Uh, so this is just a little experiment for you to kind of taste this. So here's the next thing I'm going to have you do. Now, you may, if you can do that in Tucson, that's fine. If not, just pantomime. <laughs> okay. okay, without saying anything, I want you to sit knee to knee as close as possible without touching, please. Without touching. No touching. Yeah, no touching. Okay. What I'm going to do for one full minute, I want you to maintain eye contact. Okay, not looking away. Just maintain eye contact for one full minute. Okay, let me get you, let me get you set. Okay, are you ready? Now, set, go. Amy? Okay, hang on. You have 10 more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, break it off. Okay. <laughs> Okay, here's what I would like you to do. You don't have to write this down, but just commit this if you have your paper. This is what I would like you to do. Uh, what made the activity uncomfortable? And, and what were your thoughts and emotions as you were there eye to eye for that one minute? And, and you guys know, you know it's a friendly crowd, right? Okay, with this. So what made that uncomfortable? Just some, just some thoughts. If you have nobody was uncomfortable, it was perfectly fine. You could do that all day long, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 What did you feel in that process? What was what was uncomfortable about? It? What were you feeling physically? Um, like, actually, wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Interesting. Anyone else? Amy. What did you know? Okay. Like what was the smile? What prompted the smile? Did But anybody else? What was your experience? What were you feeling? Well, of course, awkward, but it made, it made me think this person is so like me, but so different. I, I have no idea okay. anything about her, uh -huh. but yet realized that it's a, a, a person that has a life full of experiences and, you know, and, and, and while, while it's so different, but not different. Okay. That makes sense. I don't no, know. it does. No, it does. So does. Okay. 
you had a sense of you had a sense of connecting to the humanity uh, in, in that sense uh, with that uh, what unconscious sympathetic dominant fight or flight learning is reflected in your responses what we know is that you know one of the responses when we have an uncomfortable or we start to get into our sympathetic dominance or fight or flight is we smile we we'll find ourselves involuntarily smiling because that's a way to try to show what that's like coming with open hands not dangerous it eases yeah part of it, but it eases when you smile what happens it eases right a little bit you kind of feel that feel that happen what other things that you notice that you started trying to do a lot of people started talking <laughs> you have to say something <laughs> one thing did you find yourself looking off? Or did you start, what, looking in one eye, then the other? <laughs> kind of going pinging back and forth with that. You didn't get a chance for this because you're walked out. But pinging back and forth in that sense. Yeah. Now think about someone who's traumatized is that they're in that state if they aren't able to self-regulate all the time. And can you imagine them engaging in a complex discussion with you? When they're kind of like, you know, I'm trying to figure out just how to be comfortable. Just how to connect to that. That's what trauma does many times to individuals. Real quickly, I'm going to go over adverse childhood experiences. That should take a few minutes. There's a short video I'm going to show you about three minutes long. Then we're going to go into, I have a couple of case studies. Like I said, you may not have everything I have that I'll just want to talk about briefly with you give you a sense of what those are. So let me play this video uh, there in Tucson. Hopefully you can see this video as well. Has anyone ever heard of adverse childhood experiences by this time? No? A few people. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if there's a... What does your parents' divorce have to do with your risk for heart disease? If your mother had a drinking problem when you were growing up, are you more likely to suffer from depression as an adult? Here's what you should know about ACEs. ACEs stand for Adverse Childhood Experiences, extremely stressful events that can happen to a child growing up. Some experiences are so stressful that they can alter brain development, as well as the immune system, increasing the risk of lifelong health and social problems in adulthood. The term comes from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, landmark research that shed new light on the root cause of everything from stroke and liver disease to substance abuse and mental illness. In the late 1990s, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control and a preventive medicine doctor at Kaiser Permanente set out to understand the association between childhood experience and lifelong health. They asked over 17,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego about their health history, as well as difficult questions about their experiences growing up. Anda and Felitti tallied up 10 different kinds of adversity in this largely middle class and college educated population. They were stunned to see how common ACEs were. 21% of all respondents were sexually abused as children. 19% grew up with someone who suffered mental illness. 28% had been physically abused. And two out of three respondents had experienced at least one ACE. The researchers next looked at how someone's ACE score, or the number of adversities they experienced, 
related to a wide array of serious health and social problems. They saw that the more ACEs someone had, the greater their risk for poor outcomes compared with someone with no ACEs. Someone with an ACE score of four had twice the risk of heart disease and cancer. Someone with an ACE score of five had an eight times greater chance of being an alcoholic. And those with an ACE score of six or more, on average, died 20 years earlier. With every major problem they looked at in the ACE study, the risk went up for each additional adverse experience in childhood. As Dr. Robert Anda says, what's predictable is preventable. It's important to remember that ACEs are not destiny. ACEs are a tool for understanding the health of a population as a whole. For individuals, an ACE score can be a tool for understanding their own risk for health and social problems and empower them to make changes for themselves and their children. ACEs tend to get passed down from generation to generation and are common across all income levels, races, and cultures. But increasingly, people of all different professions and backgrounds are coming together to discuss how ACEs affect their communities. They're finding new ways to treat and prevent ACEs. Many doctors are starting to screen their patients for ACEs as part of their medical history. More schools are becoming trauma-informed, considering the source of problem behavior when disciplining their students instead of immediately suspending or expelling them. To learn more about interrupting the cycle of adversity and improving health and well-being for the next generation, please visit kpjrfilms.co. Back in the 1990s, research... Okay, uh, this is one of the things that in mental health and behavioral health substance abuse, they're trying to implement for everyone that they see in that system, uh, A studies. And what we know, this was done in the mid-1900s. Uh, there were 17,000 people. This study actually has been replicated and it's continuing to be replicated. There's actually a committee or a group here in Arizona that's looking specifically at ACEs in Arizona for that. Uh, the people who participated in the initial study, the 17,000 were uh, mostly college educated, middle, middle, upper middle class. That's what startled them. They expected to see this, they thought, uh, in disadvantaged socioeconomic areas. but. The type of ACEs they looked at, of course, you saw that. I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, the economic toll, the cost when someone comes in with ACEs. But here's what I wanted to try to get you to, uh, some of the current information. Uh, in 2014, a study in Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia, this is what they found in contrast to the original ACEs study. At least 83% of the population had one ACE, and 37% had at least four or more. This is looking at people who were, who, who were uh, tested there. While some numbers are improving, uh, the most problematic categories, they're getting worse. 17,000 participants, nearly 800,000 thus far have been given this. So the 12.5% to 14%, we're seeing more people with more ACEs, more severe. So that means if recall, that's a decrease in life expectancy, increase, chronic disease, alcoholism, other kind of issues. This is a pyramid that really looks at how adverse childhood experiences influence health and well-being throughout the lifespan. The bottom of the pyramid are those experiences when you're young. It disrupts neurological development. This is coming, some of the epigenetic stuff involved, the expression, right, pruning of things. Neurons, and then social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. Uh, there's difficulty uh, being in relationships successfully. We find difficulty in classrooms, other places, 
adoption of high-risk behavior. This is when people may be, what, using drugs, driving fast, uh, unprotected sex, sex, uh, that kind of thing. And then disease, disability, and social problems ultimately, and then early death. Yes? There is. Good question. Yeah, there are, there are certainly uh, people who are a little bit more hardy than others, some resilience with that. But what we know is the environment. If the environment doesn't support it, then people will begin as well to uh, show some of the deterioration and some of the problems of someone who would be less resilient. That's the tolerance level individually. If you come from a family where you've had some support, and then there's someone who comes from a family where they're completely neglected, the person with some support is going to fare better, typically. Uh, what can be done about this? We know with, uh, there's programs that have started visiting uh, pregnant mothers, young women, and others uh, while they're at home, start uh, providing services to them to educate them about ACEs, educate them about trauma, right? Parenting. Training, that's important to get parents to understand how they may support their children and not further debilitate them. Uh, intimate partner violence prevention, education around that. Uh, social support for parents. Uh, so these are some of the things that are being done to support people. Now up in the upper right, I wanted to just have you take a look at that where you see 2009 down to 2014. Those are the states where currently, where in the past 2009, and currently they've done some ACEs studies. Uh, 2014 uh, is when they did Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania rather, Arkansas, Alaska, it looks like Florida, Iowa. So they're continuing to do this across the country, and they're finding uh, more people than they anticipated have multiple ACEs. You know, as you looked at the list, you may have said, okay, I have that one. Okay. You know, I had incarceration in my family, uh, that kind of thing, alcoholism, those kind of aces. So we want to give that. Transgenerational trauma. What we know is what one generation experiences, they pass on, right? That can be through the epigenetic process. The ACEs, just a quick case review. Give you a sense of some generational stuff. Uh, Wei was a 32-year-old, gener fourth-generation Japanese-American male who grew up in Hawaii. He lived with his mother, a second-generation Japanese-American who lived through World War II. You recall what happened to Japanese-Americans in World War II? Okay. They were incarcerated, right, many. who lived in World War II and was self-referred due to social anxiety. This is Wade who self-referred to self. He longed for meaningful relationships with his peers, especially a romantic relationship, but struggled with severe anxiety whenever present, presented with an opportunity to speak with others outside of the classroom environment. In short, he had no friends and had never been involved with a significant other. The only person he spoke to on a regular basis was his mother. She raised him to pray over difficulties not to discuss them openly with strangers. Therefore, he learned to pray to God whenever he was feeling nervous or lonely, but did not actually have any successful interactions with people of his own age. Frankie's not here now, but when Frankie mentioned about uh, the Asian uh, community, really not wanting to put anything out into the community, everything's done in-house, saving face with that. This is Wade exactly with his mother. Uh, has any, anyone ever known anyone who's been hoarding? Have you ever had a patient or a client that was a hoarder? Okay. Get to have a sense. I had one of them, when I was a case manager, uh, one of my face, first uh, case management clients was a harder, hoarder, lived in a trailer. And to get in the trailer, you had to literally squeeze in. They had stacks up, newspapers and other stuff. Over the course of treatment, it became clear the way it was heavily impacted by his mother's mental illness. Right, there are multiple ACEs here. As a result of her hoarding behaviors, 
She had accumulated many objects, which greatly limited his ability to live comfortably at home. Broken furniture shoved into the den rendered the room unusable. Heaps of toilet paper rolls on the sofa meant the living room area was not an inviting area to entertain or relax. Wade became aware that his home would never be a safe place to entertain his peers and grew to be somewhat hopeless regarding the situation. So he's having right there, that describes a fight or flight kind of scenario, doesn't it? He's in a state where he's just like, just to come home makes me uncomfortable. I can't bring anybody here. So he is constantly in the sympathetic dominant states. He's in that eyeball to eyeball, so to speak, kind of feeling consistently. At one point, uh, I asked him what would happen if he were to assist his mother by helping her remove some of the stacks of newspaper that were infested by silverfish, silverfish or to slowly throw away some of the rolls of decomposing plastic bags so as to create a safe passage to move freely from one room of the house to another. Around this point in treatment, Wade, <laughs> Wade took an unannounced break from therapy after three attempts to coax him back to therapy. He eventually responded by returning a few weeks later. Uh, what happened, and this is a mistake that many therapists make, is that he wasn't ready to really deal with that. Okay. He wasn't ready, and he hadn't learned any skills to kind of talk about that even. And so he, he ran. This was his fight or flight. He ran from therapy. From then on, we utilized nonverbal ther therapy techniques to augment his treatment since speaking about his living conditions, abysmal social life, relationship with his mother were often so difficult that at times he would appear somewhat catatonic. He would go into that dorsal reflex and he would literally just freeze. He's just kind of like, no thought, I can't think, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do. Kids do that frequently, right, when they're overwhelmed. Uh, that's why play therapy and sand tray and some of the techniques we use with kids are effective. Because you can't, kids don't abstract and you can't have a conversation. I'm sorry, have a conversation with them. Over time, Wade joined a civic club on campus and practiced daily the relaxation techniques he had acquired through therapy. He was able to identify two friends by the time our two-year treatment terminated. He considered one of the biggest successes to be convincing his mother to clear a path from the living spaces in the house to his room. Upon graduation from therapy, he reflected, feeling more hopeful that he could recognize when his anxiety was provoked and how to engage in, and how to engage in exercises to better manage his feelings. So that's just a simple kind of scenario of what trauma can do to him. He wasn't being beaten or anything, but he was living in a house where there was mental illness, there was hoarding. His whole life was impacted by it. Right? No friends. He was isolated, lonely. Any comments, questions? Just kind of makes sense? Okay. Uh, a little bit more. Processing cultural trauma, intergenerational effects uh, of the Japanese-American incarceration. During World War II, 120,000 Japanese-Americans uh, were in inc incarceration camps based solely on their Japanese ancestry. And of course, one of those camps, a couple of those were here in Arizona as well. Two-thirds of those forced to live in desolated camps were US citizens. They were born here in the States. Decades later, the U.S. government concluded that Japanese Americans had suffered a grave injustice and issued a written apology and a monetary award to each surviving incarcerate. They got $20,000 each as a result of that. One of the approaches that we have and what we believe is important to successfully deal with trauma, there has to be a good structure to treatment. Uh, Dr. Roden and Dr. Gentry and Baronowski uh, just published an article in the Journal of Counseling and Development that talks about the structure that we use at Arizona Trauma Institute to work with people who have experienced trauma. Being therapists, I didn't put a lot of this in there. You don't really, but just to give you an idea, if you want to go and read that article a little bit for yourself. A little bit more information. This is on... Uh, Japanese. It took Japanese Americans who were incarcerated over four decades to overcome silence about what had happened, what they had endured, and reassert their identity. And this is interesting because the older Japanese Americans weren't the ones who initiated it. It was the younger generation that kept saying, what's up with mom? What's up with grandma? Something's going on. They're not talking. But I can tell they're uncomfortable. 
you know, they're depressed. People aren't feeling good about things. We know something happened. It's that kind of, it's just this keeping of secrets, and we see that frequently sometimes with people trauma. Uh, there was, of course, the receipt of apology and payment. That had overall positive impact, but not on all the Japanese Americans. Some of the older ones couldn't let go of that fear, couldn't let go of the trauma of that experience. Intercultural relations with other groups played a critical role. Japanese Americans' response to historical trauma. African American activists, President Carter, and other non-Japanese American allies played positive roles in advancing the healing process and suggest the benefits of intergroup dialogues that encourage awareness about historical trauma. Any questions? I'm going to move on. I'm going to get you out of here, but I wanted to let you know Trauma is intergenerational and transgenerational. Some stats for you. In 2013, war and persecution created the highest number of global refugees. 51.2 million people were refugees. That was the highest since World War II. And that was from the United Nations High Commissions of Refugees. This is 6 million more than the 45.2 million who were displaced the year before in 2012. Right? Number of refugees worldwide now equals the entire population of Spain, South Africa, South Korea, and more than double the inhabitants of Australia. The increasing number of refugees is due to over ongoing excuse me, conflicts, such as those in Syria, the Central African Republic, the Congo, South Sudan. Have you seen any of those individuals in the valley? I work with some Somalis, I've worked with people from Syria, I've worked with Romanians, I've worked with people from the Sudan. In fact, their whole, their pieces of apartment complexes where you have groups of people living, where they've been placed in that. Intergenerational trauma and displacement. Often their departure is sudden. People uh, don't plan to leave those places, they're, they're driven out. Uh, they don't know where they're going. Uh, they don't know how they're going to get there. They travel, means of travel. They face threats uh, to their safety. There are some great movies about people coming from Central America and Mexico up north to America that talks about some of what they go through. Of course, we hear about coyotes who abandon people in the desert. Or recently, there was a semi where people died. They were stuck in the back of that. Psychological and physical danger uh, on the way here. In 2013, there was 1.1 million refugees seeking asylum in developed countries, with a large number being unaccompanied minors, children separated from their parents. A lot of the refugees are kids or young people, aren't quite adults. Syria had the largest number of asylum applications with 64,300, followed by the Dem Democratic Republic of the Congo, that was 60,000. In Myanmar, 57,000. Uh, most refugees continue to come from developing countries and consist mainly of women, children, and people with disabilities. That's the other thing. Uh, people with disabilities who are refugees who come here have difficulty connecting to services sometimes as well. The point of all this is that all these individuals have been through a traumatic experience, and a large number of them are suffering from symptoms, PTSD symptoms. 70,000 refugees were authorized to resettle in the United States in 20, between 2013 and 2014, predominantly came from Africa and Cuba. Surprising? Iraq, Africa, and Cuba is where most of the refugees from 2013 to 2014 came to the United States from. Uh, some additional things, additional challenges facing global refugees. So some of the people that you may be seeing, right, post-displacement and migration, psychosocial adjustment, difficulty just adjusting. Uh, secondary trauma and cumulative trauma during their migration Survivor's guilt, I've worked with people who, when they get here, they talk about the parent or the child they lost or the spouse. 
and they're depressed and they're grieving. Uh, cultural shock, of course. Uh, get here, can't speak the language. Don't like the food. No one understands me. And then count transference, there are people who basically are saying, go home. We don't want you. You don't belong here. So they're facing that. They lack, of course, uh, language skills. Uh, they're underemployed or unemployed. Educational background may hinder. Some may not. But there will be others who will be highly educated. Uh, I met a guy that was a doctor that was driving the cab. Here, there was a doctor back, uh, where was he? A doctor back in Iraq. I went down. But he couldn't practice here. Culture also affects help-seeking behavior. Again, uh, some cultures just don't reach out. If you don't connect to them, they're not going to come see you. Uh, Big issue also, of course, is racism, discrimination. Uh, the addressing model was intended to give you a sense that you really can't see every refugee that stands before you the same way. You have to take them individually, and you have to learn about their scenario, their situation. Displacement and pre-migration situations of war and conflict may involve all of these things, from witnessing torture to being tortured, right? Killings, incarcerations, deprivation. No food or shelter, physical beatings, rape, sexual assault. And just want to give you a little contrast between Latino youth in the U.S. and foreign-born young people who come to this country as well. So you have a little sense of the contrast. Uh, Bridges in 2010 reported a limited number of studies that suggest there's a marked difference between the ways foreign-born Latino youth versus U.S.-born Latino youth react to trauma, and because we get a lot of people here in Arizona, the thing that they said essentially is that U.S. born Latino youth, I got it, tend to suffer from more internalized distress, foreign born, I'm sorry, uh, suffer from more internalized distress. The U.S. born uh, frequently are the ones who get involved in behaviors that end up getting them involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, you've heard the term from the classroom, uh, the pipeline, to the prison or to the juvenile justice system. Many times it's because people haven't successfully made a transition or they may be suffering without receiving any support. Okay, let's see what else. One more case review. Any questions? I'm going through this quickly, but does that make sense? I want to make sure you're catching at least a couple of points I want to make. This is one with Jose Luis, a 16-year-old student, and his parents are naturalized citizens, originally from Mexico City. Both he and his parents don't speak English well, and his parents are taking English classes as a second language. Classes offered at a local Hispanic community center. One day at high school, Jose Luis gets into a fist fight with another student over a cell phone. Immediately, the police are called to the scene, and both students are arrested and taken to the police station. Even though Jose Luis speaks English better than his parents. He doesn't know what's going on, and his parents do not fully understand what has happened because both the police and the parents face language barriers with each other and cannot communicate. Is this an uncommon scenario in the Valley? Not as much as you think. Okay. Throughout the whole process, Jose Luis's parents relied on him for translation because legal documents were not available in Spanish. And there were no interpreters to help them navigate the system. Do you provide assistance because you work with victims of someone's that? Do you help them navigate the system? Are there resources for them to connect to? You provide education for them as well? Better? Okay. You're not where you would like to be with that. Okay. That's, that's critical. Uh, even though Jose Luis did not understand legal terminology himself, he was left to convey every step of the system to his parents from the moment he had been picked up from the police station to receiving court notification letters, appearing before the judge, signing waivers, working with public defenders, 
Jose Luis was sentenced to two years at the juvenile detention facility 300 miles away from his parents. Upon release, Jose Luis dropped out of high school and ended up in jail again as an adult. And there's a cycle, got into that cycle without that. Yeah. So the services you provide and the support you provide for victims or education about the system or resources is critical for many people who are coming in who particularly are, are migrants or who haven't lived in this country and don't understand the laws, don't understand the language, et cetera. And in Arizona, we have really a unique mix of people, surprisingly. Okay. I think someone's coffee just smells good to me right now. <laughs> uh, Jose Luis's outcome might have been different if he had had his parents and his parents had better understood the judicial process, the rights to receive information in primary language. Uh, if this were the case, they could have advocated for their son to attend anger management sessions at the same Hispanic center where they attended English classes. Upon completing his treatment, Jose Luis would have graduated from his high school, headed on to college, a dream he always wanted to accomplish. Research has demonstrated time and time again that compared to incarceration alone, community-based programs are less expensive, more effective in helping troubled youth get their lives back and on track. Do you find that to be true with the victims you work with or family members? Community resources are better than getting them locked up. Okay. <laughs> Some resources. Okay. Got that, yeah. In his case, he was both, he could be either a victim or a defendant. He got in a fight, and depending on how it gets written up, who who's the one that kind of ends up with the most blame. That's like an insurance, that's like a car accident I had one time. Someone backed into me. I was at a stoplight, and they pulled too far ahead to the thing, and in their hurry, they just backed straight up into me. I was parked, right? When the cop got there, they told the cop that I ran into them. So the cop, well, I don't know whose story to believe. I said, you don't see any skid marks, do you? Right, I'm trying to argue my case. He said, he said, no. They said, well, he was going maybe about 25, 30 miles. I was out. I said, no, I was stopped. Right, anybody else around could have witnessed was gone already. Right? And so what he did is he wrote the citation a certain way and other stuff that I received part of the blame. So it matters, you know, those things, the kind of thing. And I'm like, what? You could do that? <laughs> so I didn't do that. So I tried to fight that, et cetera, but my insurance rate still went up. You know, I was young. I think I was maybe about you know, late 20s. But I was like, this is crazy. But anyway, thank you. Okay. You did great for sitting down for so long. Uh, any questions? Anything that I tried to cover broadly, but I know there's a lot. To do this justice is really, a, Amy, to do this justice really is when we talk about trauma, it's usually a day at minimum, two-day training, and then multicultural, same thing, because we could talk about Pacific cultures. But I just want to give you just, for three hours, down and dirty. Okay. Yes? Yes. You're, you know, you're doing that if you can connect them to, some, to something that might help their resiliency. We talk a lot about developing resiliency and competency around this. If they're not seeing a therapist, if they're seeing a therapist, uh, it's good to be able to kind of have that collaboration so they get that support. And if they're willing to let you talk to a therapist, a sign of release to let you have that conversation, then the therapist can be supportive and kind of help them with some additional skills to get through that. Uh, the other are family members themselves. A family member sometimes are, you know, they just kind of feel like they're on the sideline. They're just, 
okay, we're watching. We hope you get help. You know, that's a nice lady you're working with, nice guy. They seem like they want to help you. But they really aren't vested to the degree they understand the process and what's going on necessarily, or they might. And if they do, giving them uh, some encouragement and some validation about being supportive with that. And then also whatever resources and whatever resources they may have in addition, if they have spiritual resources, sometimes we have a priest, sometimes we have a pastor, okay, that we can talk to. There's someone who we turn to if we're having difficulty. We can provide that. Mm -hmm. Yes. To touch on these diversities and these cultural and religious and ethnic identities because we don't want to get scared like we shouldn't. Yeah, like we don't don't want to yeah. say the wrong thing and then it'd be perceived that you know our government mm -hmm. agency is in some way sensitive or gotcha. you know, mm -hmm. and That's, that's perfect lead into it. Yeah. You know, one of, one of the things that therapists learn is that if you don't know, ask. You know, the worst thing you can do is presume and then really get it, get it wrong. But ask. There's a lot you're not going to know. You know, there's no way to know every... When I was in Africa, I asked about Africa because there's over 3,000 dialects. But people communicate using Swahili for commerce throughout Africa. That's how people are able to do that. But you can be in literally a 50-mile square radius and hear 30 different types of dialects from people with that. Uh, so asking uh, is going to be important. I think, you know, what you raised. Uh, policies and procedures, we talked about uh, organizations that are culturally competent, is that they begin to become sensitive to those kind of issues for people who have to be on the front line. We need to try to make sure we support you in helping people uh, get the resources. Uh, we can tell you from therapy, this is what we know from research and from a lot of therapy practice base, is that what accounts for change for the better for people in therapy isn't necessarily what your particular therapeutic model is, right? Whether you are psychoanalytic, whether you're gestalt, whether you're CBT or anything else, that only accounts for about 15% of what drives the positive outcome in therapy. 15% of what drives the positive outcome is just placebo. Just like when you call your doctor and you're sick, just to get an appointment, you start to feel better already. Okay, I know I'm going to see my doc. I'm going to get there. So I'm feeling a little less anxious about it. That's the placebo effect. 30% right? of what accounts for the positive outcome is the relationship with the therapist. The relationship with you really is going to be critical to them because you're the point of contact. You're the reality of the experience. You know? And we know that people heal through relationships as well as they get ill through relationships. Uh, the other part of that, which is critical and why I asked about resources, is that that 40% that's left right out of that 15, 15, and 30, that 40% extra therapeutic, that really has natural resources, natural strengths. Those things, family, churches, whatever may be their community center, like in this example, those things, those resources. That's important. So a couple of things have to happen for professionals. One of the things that we're doing with therapists is we're helping them become health literate. You know, many therapists, despite being in the healthcare field, they don't really, they're not really literate about health issues. You know, who do you contact? Where do you go? Can I actually, have you been to a physician's office or a dental office lately and gotten that packet of papers to start looking at, inform consent, start reading, right? What we're finding is that a vast majority of people, and I wouldn't say vast majority, let's put it this way, a significant number of people, about 30 to 40 percent, are below basic literary, liter, literacy and they can't read at a sixth grade level. Most of that stuff gets written somewhere around depending on difficulty, ninth or 10th grade level. And they can't understand it. For you attorneys that read legal, legal you know how that is, right? It's, they start saying, I said, no, go see my attorney. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. But the same thing about health care, right? There was a scenario where a woman, young woman, right, she 
traveled, she was doing well, middle class, but she hadn't learned to read very well. She hadn't gotten a lot of education and she was having some issues, female issues, went to a doctor. They threw all this paperwork in front of her. Long story short is she didn't know what was there. She didn't want to seem stupid, appear at that. She signed this stuff and they told her, well, you show back up, okay, and we'll take care of this. So long story short, she ended up getting a hysterectomy she didn't know she got. When she returned for the follow-up, she's a young woman. She hadn't had kids. And she returns for the follow-up and says, okay, you know, that problem, I, you know, and the person that greets her says, well, how, how was the hysterectomy? And she's like, huh? My elf dropped, like, what? I had a hysterectomy? She didn't even know what they did to her body. And that's what happens in terms of not being health literate. And we see that all the time around mental health issues, around physical issues. That's just an example, but unfortunately it happens with parents with their kids. Kids are getting procedures or other things. There's a whole history of eugenics in this country where people didn't know they were getting a procedure. They're being sterilized. Okay. And unfortunately it happened mostly to people of color and minorities. You know, there was a recent, not too long ago, a study that looked at what was happening in California prisons where there were inmates who were being sterilized. And that was just in 2000 teens, and, and they just stopped that. So health literacy is critical, and so that should be, I would certainly encourage everyone to become literate, become more literate. Have you ever tried, I mean, literally, have you ever tried to read some of the instructions you get, right? And then some of the bottles, the medic, writing on medication bottles, if it's written in medical lingual, you know, BID, TID, PO, that kind of thing. Does a person understand it? So we see a lot of that. So that would be important, I think, in supporting the people that you're working with. If you can help them become literate, uh, find resources uh, to help them. Uh, advocacy, you're providing advocacy, obviously, on their behalf. Uh, that's important. And, and get whatever natural support's involved in the process that they have you know, with that. Uh, And that's when you want that extra support, yeah. Legally, I, because the machinery works, you know. I mean, the process, the bureaucracy, you have to do what you have to do, and you have a time, time frame, so you push through that. But as you're pushing through that to try to bring in, and as you get better, I mean, if you get the resources and the organization becomes uh, trauma-sensitive, trauma-informed, and culturally sensitive, then you can begin to kind of front load some of the things that you can anticipate uh, would be helpful to people uh, with that. But the fact that you and your relationship, you're mindful and you're aware makes a big difference. Uh, everyone wants to be understood. And the fact that you're willing to do that makes, takes, goes a long way. Because many times people get in particularly legal systems or formal systems and they feel like no one really, they may not understand what's going on, but they feel like no one really understands their level of confusion or maybe fear or, you know, or what their particular point is, what they believe is a valid, you know, thing to be considered in the process. Thank you. Good question. Anyone else? Oh. Is that enough? You want to go eat and then go home? Get your Friday? Okay. I know you do. I, I appreciate you. Thank you. That's it for me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Have a good weekend, Tucson. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Good to. What? No. Well, thank you.